Okay, now, good morning to everyone. Uh, nice to see you here this morning. I hope you all had a good uh, week off. Um, it feels like it's much further ahead in spring than I really expected it to be. Um, but it feels like spring now, which is great, uh, which means we don't have very long to go. I think we've only got a few more lectures left, really. Uh, and then we've got a final exam. So uh, welcome to the second half of the second half of the term. Um, I've got a few announcements to make, uh, and then we'll get to the business of talking about uh, inductive reasoning and inferences. So uh, first uh, announcement that I want to make is uh, concerning the final exam. So as uh, you probably have already checked online, you know when your exam schedules are, uh, and you should be aware that our exam is Monday, April 15th. It's not the worst possible day. It's not the best possible day. It's kind of right in the middle. Uh, so it's kind of a Monday afternoon. I could think of worst possible times to have a, a final exam. Um, we'll all be in Arts and Humanities 15. Uh, I forget exactly what the quality of that room is like, but I'm sure it's no worse than this room, uh, but I suspect there's more room to spread out a little bit in. Uh, so that'll be our final exam. The final exam is gonna be the same format. Uh, it'll be a mix of multiple choice and written uh, and roughly the same balance. Uh, so I think the balance of points for the uh, midterm was 40 or 45 points of multiple choice and 20 points uh, for short answer. So you can expect something similar, though it is gonna be a little bit, I think it'll be worth a few more points. It's also worth a higher proportion. Uh, it's also, yes. So that's alumni, hall. alumni hall. So just ignore what I said about um, arts and humanities. That would be uh, a different building entirely. Uh, so just follow the instructions that are on the website. Uh, that's better than listening to me uh, try to decipher the building codes. Thank you for looking that up. It's alumni hall, which is usually where these kind of bigger exams are going to be. So you probably have been there before, right? It's one of those basement uh, sort of gym-like rooms uh, in uh, Alumni Hall. They'll have it set up with desks. We'll do our uh, final exam. It'll feel kind of like the midterm, same general vibe. Uh, it's worth more. Uh, it's also a, um, a comprehensive exam, a cumulative final exam. So although the bulk of the questions will be from the second half, I'll still throw in a few questions from the first half. Uh, and we'll have a lot more to talk about in terms of preparing for the final exam. Uh, and just like with the midterm, I'll have a final exam guide ready for you uh, that you can use to sort of help structure some of your uh, studying. Uh, with respect to the midterm, some of you may be wondering, uh, where are the grades uh, from the midterm? They will be ready very soon, presently, uh, within the next uh, day or so. Uh, so the multiple choice component obviously scores really quickly, but it does take some time uh, to go through the written proportion. Uh, we've got about 150 students in the class, uh, which you probably noticed when you were here taking the exam, that actually it fills the classroom up when everybody's here. Um, so it, it'll take just another day or so, uh, and then making sure everything is uh, calculated properly, added together properly, and they'll be released on OWL, uh, hopefully within the next uh, day. Uh, so you should see those soon. Uh, I apologize they're not ready yet, but they will be ready very soon. Any questions on any of that before I go on to the next uh, announcement? So let's look at what we're going to be covering uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be covering really uh, the thinking part of the class. So the first part of this class, the first half of this class, established some of the baselines. It established some of the basic cognitive processes. That's why we had uh, a course on similarity. Uh, similarity underlies a lot of these other things we wanted to talk about. In fact, that was the whole first half of the similarity lecture is what is similarity good for with respect to thinking? Uh, then we talked about knowledge and memory. And the first half of that lecture was how do we use our memories when we're thinking about things? How do we solve problems and make uh, reason about things uh, and make decisions? Uh, then we talked about concepts and categories. And that was another question. Uh, a, a section of the lecture, which was, what do we use concepts for in our thinking? Uh, and then we talked about how language helps to structure thinking. So a lot of that first half of the class was all about establishing the basic cognitive processes. The second half of this course is about thinking itself. Uh, and so we'll start with induction, uh, and then we're going to move on to uh, reasoning and logic. 
So mostly deductive logic. Uh, and there's also some content on causal reasoning, which we'll uh, introduce a little bit today when we talk about correlations, and we'll talk a lot more about next week. Uh, then we follow the textbook pretty closely. We've got uh, a section on how your mood uh, affects your thinking, how context uh, affects your thinking, and how your motivation affects your thinking. Um, we've got a whole section on decision-making, problem solving and creativity, and finally, what it means to be an expert uh, and how experts differ uh, in their cognition. And then we will uh, reconvene on April 15th uh, to do exam number two. Uh, we also have a number of quizzes coming up. Uh, next uh, week will be quiz number three, and that covers today's lecture and next week's lecture. It'll be an online quiz, exactly the same format, number of questions uh, as the other quizzes. If you found these quizzes helpful, uh, and if you found them a good way to prepare and to sort of give you an idea of how well you understand the information, uh, if you felt after doing the quizzes uh, that they were a relatively good uh, representation of the kind of multiple choice questions that you would see in the midterm, uh, then that's great. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. You should be doing reasonably well on these quizzes. Um, if for some reason you find as if you're just struggling on them, please let me know or contact me, contact Chelsea, come to one of our uh, office hours, uh, and we can talk about those things. Uh, we've got two more quizzes. Remember, we have a quiz that covers the second, uh, sort of the second chunk of this second half. And then we have this fifth quiz, which is cumulative. Uh, and remember, I'm going to be uh, keeping the top four of the five quiz grades. So if you take all five, I'll score the top uh, five, four. Uh, if you missed one, uh, I'll drop that lowest one. If you've scored a perfect score on every one of these, feel free to take quiz number five anyway, because it's a good way to prepare and study some new questions. Uh, I'll always take the top four of the five quizzes. Any questions on quizzes? How are you finding the quizzes so far? Is that thunder? That was thunder, was it not? I don't expect thunder in February very often. Did you look at what it's going to have, what the weather's going to do this week? I hate to be one of these guys that talks about the weather all the time, but evidently I am. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to plummet to like minus seven again and then go back up to plus 17 over the weekend. The weekend looks great, uh, but getting there is going to be kind of rough. So I guess I am one of those guys that talks about the weather because it seems to be changing um, more rapidly than I'm ready for. Any questions on quizzes? How are you all finding the quizzes? Are they reasonably good? Are you doing reasonably well on them? Good. All right, we'll keep them up. Okay, so let's talk about uh, today's content then. So what I want to talk about today, in the first half, we're going to talk about the difference between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. They're both forms of reasoning, uh, and we use them kind of simultaneously when we think about things. Uh, one of the reasons it sometimes is, I, I find at least, that it's hard to tell the difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning is that when you think about things and when you make uh, generalizations and when you make conclusions, you're often doing both of them back and forth. We look at evidence, we draw some conclusions from that evidence, and then we make a prediction about something or an inference about something. Sometimes it's a generalization, sometimes it's a specific conclusion. Uh, and those are both hallmarks of induction and deduction. I'll try to separate them out in terms of definitions, but for all practical purposes, when you're thinking, uh, and when you're behaving and making decisions, you're doing both of these things uh, simultaneously. So we're going to talk about deduction and induction. We're going to talk about how induction works for the first half of the class. Uh, then we'll take a short break and we'll talk about the problem of induction. Uh, this is a philosophical problem, uh, but it underlies the complex nature of trying to understand how and why we rely on the past to make conclusions about things in the future. Uh, then we'll talk about two different kinds of uh, models or theories of induction. One is uh, the idea of categorical induction. Categorical induction assumes that when you make inductions, you rely on categories and concepts. Uh, so we'll build on some of our knowledge about uh, concepts and categories from uh, lecture number four and some of our knowledge from uh, lecture number three on memory. Uh, then we'll talk about coherence, the coherence of categories, the coherence of concepts, helps us decide exactly how we're going to make uh, inductions and inferences. So let's continue. I feel like I might as well just step over here every time. 
Uh, so the difference between induction and deduction. For our purposes, inductive thinking is a specific to general kind of thought process. So specific to general means that you make a lot of observations and you lead to a, uh, a general theory or a general hypothesis. Uh, you lead to some uh, understanding, you infer something or you induce an understanding about the world based on specific information. So it's a specific to general process. If you are, let's say we, you know, I sometimes make comments about uh, the geese on campus. Uh, and as climate change, and especially this year with El Nino has made things warmer, uh, the geese have become agitated sooner <laughs> than they usually do. Uh, and you probably make observations about them, right? If you, the first time you're, how many of you remember encountering the geese during your first year on campus and sort of being surprised at just how much of a presence they have uh, on campus, unless you live in London? Uh, and have been on campus before, it's sometimes kind of amazing uh, just how present, <laughs> how big of a deal they are for a short period of time. So you make some observations about them. Well, they stand at the corner of every building and they start squawking in the spring, right? Uh, and then maybe you start to make some uh, general understanding from each specific observation. Every time I walk past that building, every time I walk past that particular area, a goose starts carrying on. So probably maybe there's something about that area. Maybe that's their nest. Uh, maybe that's where they've decided to take up a uh, watch. Maybe I should avoid that area. So you start to make some uh, take these individual observations, specific observations, and make a general conclusion. So it's a bottom-up process. Where it gets confusing is that although we've defined and understand inductive reasoning as specific to general, we often behave towards those general conclusions by making a specific decision. So in other words, you might draw a general understanding of geese, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you are making a conclusion on that general evidence, right? Uh, and you're making a, a conclusion based on what you think is most likely to happen. You're not necessarily using strict deductive logic, but what you're using is your general conclusion to alter your behavior. So you're making a specific inference in uh, making a specific inference uh, as a way to uh, enact your general conclusion. Does that seem clear? So it, Induction is specific to general, but when we use it on a day-to-day -day basis, we're still making a specific conclusion. Uh, this is different from deductive thinking. With deductive thinking, uh, we often have a hypothesis that leads to systematic observations. Uh, a premise can lead to a specific conclusion. Now, that sounds a lot like what I just said we do with induction. The difference with the uh, general to specific nature of deductive logic is that there's a framework uh, that we can understand, a framework that lets us know that our conclusion is valid or not based on how we've understood the evidence. With an inductive inference, we take what we know to be generally true uh, and we make a conclusion uh, based on what we think is most likely to happen. It's a probabilistic process. Sometimes we're wrong. With deduction, we take this general set of uh, understandings, a general set of premises, and we make a very specific conclusion that if we've done our thinking properly, uh, we can be confident in knowing that that conclusion is true, uh, if the premises are true. As we'll see next week, deductive logic has a framework that if you apply that framework, your thinking can be more precise. And that's different from inductive inferences where we assume that there's a probability uh, that our conclusions will be correct, but they're not always correct. Inductive reasoning has a probabilistic output. Deductive thinking uh, has a, a valid or a non-valid output. Does that seem pretty straightforward and clear to everyone? Great, I'll probably return to this very same slide next week uh, when I talk about uh, deductive logic. So induction is the process of using what you know to predict what you will probably observe giving so, given some set of features or stimuli. So it's using what we know, 
using what you expect about any particular scenario. That means you're using your memory. That means you're using concepts and categories. That means you're using language. All of the things that you use to understand the world. You're using your understanding of the world to predict what's probably going to happen next. Uh, what's probably going to be observed. Uh, given some set of features uh, or stimuli. And we've talked about this already in our lecture on similarity. Uh, we talked about how we use the process of induction. That once we've classified the Hubbard squash as a member of the winter squash category, we make an inference about what we're going to find when we cut it open. You don't have to see what's inside every pumpkin. You don't have to see what's inside every Hubbard squash. You kind of know what's inside. So you probably expect it to look a certain way. Uh, if you've ever cut open a piece of fruit, then it looks different. Uh, like if it's maybe uh, started to decompose or rot on the inside, you don't expect it, right? So you think, well, something has gone wrong. Uh, my inferences were incorrect. Uh, if you've ever uh, encountered someone that you expect to act in a certain way and they don't act the way you expect, uh, then you adjust your expectations. You adjust your knowledge. So we've already talked about how we make these inferences, how we make these predictions. Um, most of our behavior, most of our thinking, in fact, if I had an entire, if I could sum this entire course up into one idea, most of our thinking uh, is making inferences, uh, making inductions based on what we know, making predictions to reduce the uncertainty, and then adjusting our information based on the output of those decisions. In other words, inductive reasoning and inferential reasoning uh, is really at the cornerstone of the thinking process. So, so let's talk about some specific examples. I overheard some chatter, as I often do while I'm uh, trying to struggle to log in to four different services uh, on the uh, PC here <clears throat> about everybody doing things over the break. Uh, so give me some examples. What did you do over the break? Can someone volunteer either an exciting or a not exciting example of something that happened during your uh, February break? I went away to Cuba with Western for an exchange program. Okay. So we like Went to go visit primary schools and the University of Olguin. Okay. We became, we became really good friends with them. Um, and then throughout the week, we just hung out with them and then went to like, just did a lot of local in the city stuff. Yeah. Uh, we stayed in hostels. So it was very like immersed, like in their city. Yeah. So that sounds like a really good trip, actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, an exchange trip, uh, visiting different uh, primary schools, uh, staying in hostels. Uh, and let's talk about how induction or inference might have been used. Uh, so from your example, uh, and let's, let's all consider this, the, you don't mind if we all share your example. Uh, let's all consider this example. Uh, what are things that you might expect uh, based on what you already know? What's an example of an inference or an induction that you might have made based on some prior evidence? Don't drink their water. Don't drink the water if you're not expected. How many of you have also made this uh, type of inference or induction that when you're traveling anywhere, uh, you might not be prepared for uh, the local water? Uh, I, I mean, I even think about that coming to London. <laughs> uh, am I prepared for the treated water that comes out of Lake Erie? I don't know. Uh, and so did you get feedback from that directly or? Well, Right now it's worse. So like there's a lot of places that are filling up even like bottled water where you're buying water. It's yeah. also like tap. And so a lot of tourists are getting sick because they're not aware that even the water that you're buying. Okay. So that is an interesting one because that suggests we have several things that we might have relied on to make uh, conclusions. So we all have probably heard this or experienced this uh, piece of advice when you travel anywhere. Uh, outside of your local biome, uh, and that's an idea called bioregionalism, right? You get familiar with what's uh, the, the biome that's your region. You travel to a different bioregion, uh, you might not want to drink the water right away. And so the suggestion is, uh, I would rely on bottled water. Uh, you might rely on uh, something that you can purchase that you think has been treated. Uh, so that would be an example of a sensible conclusion, uh, but one that might need to be adjusted. Uh, because then if you collect some specific observations that, wait a minute, the bottled water is being filled from a tap, uh, which it is kind of here as well, uh, but if it's being filled from a tap that is not uh, treated in the way that you're ready for, uh, then you may not be protecting yourself at all. 
Uh, and so then you probably have to make some new conclusions. Well, when I travel to this particular region, the bottled water may have the same risks. Uh, and so therefore I might wanna choose uh, an alternative way to get hydrated uh, or something like that. So that's a great example. Um, can anybody give me a different kind of example? An, an, another example uh, of something that you did or something that happened over your February break, and then we can discuss how you might've made a conclusion based on the evidence. Yes. Got my wisdom teeth out. You got your wisdom teeth out. That sounds just as much fun uh, as, <laughs> as a trip. So tell me about your wisdom teeth experience. Um. I thought it was going to be a lot worse because my brother was like so swollen after and like he was, I don't know, his was a lot deeper and I think he got his when he was like 23. So, yeah. but mine wasn't as bad. Like I kind of just chilled. And yeah. That's really the day after. So. so it was not a bad experience. So that's another good example. You had a little bit of prior evidence. Your prior evidence was my brother got his wisdom teeth out uh, and uh, he experienced a lot of swelling afterwards. Uh, and so that might've been your specific to general which your general conclusion would be, when the wisdom teeth are taken out, uh, there's a lot of swelling and you can need a few days to recover. Uh, so you probably expected that. Uh, and when it didn't materialize, maybe you thought, well, okay, perhaps maybe it isn't always that way. Uh, or maybe there's more variability in the outcomes than I was expecting. That's a good example. Uh, you had your hand up for one last example. Oh, snow machining and ice fishing. So, snow machining and ice fishing. Uh, so how does induction work into that? So give me a little example of sort of the experience. What were you expecting? That's a really good inference. Uh, so that's a terrific example, uh, I think. So if, how many of you also were looking forward to potentially engaging in wintertime activities uh, and found that there was, that it was lacking? Uh, so I can totally sympathize with you there. Um, we had planned, uh, my uh, fam our family had planned back in uh, the, between uh, Christmas and New Year's to do some winter camping, which we then uh, later abandoned because it was muddy and raining the entire time and nobody wanted to spend three days uh, between Christmas and New Year's uh, walking through the rain and mud to use the washroom outside. Uh, it's not... <laughs> It's actually great when it's really cold in winter. Uh, it's not so great when it's warm and uh, uh, warm and uh, uh, muddy. So uh, that might be another example where you've drawn some general conclusions. Hey, February break, great time uh, to go skiing, great time to go cross country skiing, great time to do ice fishing, great time to do any of those kind of winter time activities that you'd love to do. Uh, if you weren't going somewhere warm, you wanna go somewhere cold, right? Uh, and if those are the things you were looking forward to, you might find that your expectations or your generalizations uh, didn't hold up. Uh, so in all of these cases, I think these are all three really different examples, uh, traveling to do uh, an exchange program in Cuba, getting your wisdom teeth out, uh, and doing some ice fishing. Uh, great examples where you might have had some specific evidence that you've accumulated throughout the years, whether it's direct evidence with ice fishing before or your brother's wisdom teeth or advice uh, about what to drink, all great examples. Uh, and in each case, you found an example of a prediction that you might've made uh, that you had to adjust uh, some of your prior um, expectations. When we talk about decision-making in a few weeks, we'll have a lot more to say about adjusting your priors. Uh, a lot more to say about how you adjust uh, expectations so that you can make the right decisions. Uh, so all of these are examples of inductive reasoning. And the reason I like to bring these up is that you don't think about making inductions, right? You don't think about making inferences. Uh, you just take people's advice and you remember things that happened and you try to uh, reduce uncertainty and behave in, in an appropriate way. So inferences, well, I'm going to define, we talked about what inductive reasoning is. Uh, an inference uh, in induction are conclusions based on available evidence. So in all of these cases, what water to, uh, you know, where to buy water and what to expect when you're drinking different kinds of water, what to expect after your uh, wisdom teeth and what to expect when you uh, go ice fishing uh, in February are conclusions based on the available evidence. And the available evidence in this case is, what have I experienced in the past? Uh, what have I learned? And also the available evidence for what is happening around me right now. 
Um, these can be specific and general. So we're always updating our expectations. In other words, we're always updating our understanding of these general conclusions that we draw from specific evidence. If you travel to Cuba four different times on a type on that type of exchange program, uh, each one of those becomes part of your specific to general inductive process. But uh, as those general conclusions are updated, it allows you to make better specific conclusions. So here's another example. I talk about this in the textbook, and I've, I've, I need to update my uh, general conclusions about this because this has changed a lot uh, in the years since I wrote this textbook. So of those of you that are using the first edition of this textbook, I wrote that in 2014 and 2015. Uh, so almost 10 years ago, actually I started writing it more than 10 years ago. Uh, and when I wrote this more than 10 years ago, uh, we had what they referred to in olden times as a landline telephone. You all remember the landline telephone, right? It was a wire that came to your house uh, and people, uh, you know, your grandparents might call uh, or you might call to deliver, you know, to order a pizza or something like that. So it was a phone. Um, and you probably also remember that sometimes you would get uh, basically the telephone version of those useless texts that say, we can't deliver your package. Click here on this sketchy website to provide some personal information. Uh, and usually it was a machine, but sometimes it was a real person uh, calling to either tell you there was a warrant for your arrest uh, or that they were going to give you a discount on some kind of duct cleaning service. And we found that it was always, and you probably remember this from when you were younger, it was always between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, that's when we got most of the calls. As you could tell when calls came in, if nobody left a, a voicemail or a message, um, there wouldn't be anything there. So all these calls would come in during what I guess is kind of like normal dinner time uh, for people, whether they have families or not. Most people are home. Uh, the majority of people are going to be home during that time, right? Because most work is ended or you're beginning another shift. Usually there's somebody in the house between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. So telemarketers call between the hours of 4 and 7. I say not anymore. I got rid of a landline years ago. Um, this now needs to be updated again because although we got rid of the landline like eight years ago, uh, in the last few years, that number of text-based uh, 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 things have has increased quite a lot. These don't seem to respect any particular time boundary. They just come in uh, whenever, right? I mean, you can get these in the middle of the night because they're all out of it. So here's the specific inference. It's happened in the past. Every time somebody would call between four and seven, there was a 100% chance, nearly a 100% chance that it was not somebody I actually wanted to talk to, right? It wasn't a family member. Uh, it wasn't an important piece of information. It was usually somebody calling to sell something uh, or to try to trick you into doing something else, right? And you make this same inference when you get phone calls from uh, people that you don't recognize, they're not in your contacts, or when you get uh, you know, messages from uh, RBC and you don't have an account there, uh, or you get messages uh, to your uh, phone number from not being able to process your Spotify payment when in fact they don't have your phone number, they have your email address. So you can sort of make those conclusions. So it's happened in the past. So I infer based on all of that specific information and observations, I make a general conclusion. You know what? Anybody calls between four and seven, it's not somebody I want to talk to. And so I could infer that the caller this time is also not worth talking to. Now, the companies uh, that were doing this, of course, were also making an informed uh, generalization. They were making the informed idea that, look, when we program these calls to happen between four and seven, uh, there's more likely to be someone home. That's happened in the past. And so we can assume that if it's happened in the past, it's happened in the future. Induction is all about using the past to predict the future because something worked in the past, a prediction was valid in the past, or it was confirmed in the past, you then assume that that same prediction uh, is gonna work in the future. You mentioned uh, going out ice fishing or uh, riding a snowmobile. Uh, those things in the past, you might've expected more snow uh, in mid-February. So just because you would expect it to ha have worked in the past, you use that past information to make a prediction uh, in the future. So this is an example. These are all examples of using the past to predict the future. So that's an inference. 
That's a specific conclusion that you're drawing based on your general conclusions. Uh, generalization is an inductive inference about a whole class or a group of things. So rather than just, oh, this person who's called me right now or this text message uh, is not one that I need to respond to, you're taking that specific to general information and then using it to help your behavior on a specific example. Uh, when we make a generalization, we're reasoning about a whole class of things or a whole group of things. Um, and oftentimes we gave some examples from a few uh, weeks ago when we talked about uh, memory. We gave some examples of positive or negative associations you might have with police officers. And we suggested that perhaps maybe uh, if they have a certain kind of uniform or certain kind of equipment, uh, you might alter your perspectives. Um, do you remember last year, was it just last year, only a year ago, or was it two years ago when uh, the Freedom Convoy held out in Ottawa for about a month? Was that 2022? That was 2022, wasn't it? Or was that 2023? That was 23, right? That was just a year ago. Two years ago. Okay. I thought it was two years ago. And then I just, are you all like me and you can't remember anything from the last... It's like the last four years have been 15 years condensed into four days. Uh, that's how I feel sometimes. So it was two years ago. Do you remember the Freedom Convoy? Two years ago. It's come back in the news, of course, because uh, the government uh, finally, uh, I guess, has been you know, suggested maybe they didn't need to use the Emergencies Act. Uh, maybe they could have done things differently. So uh, it's going to be in the news probably for a little while uh, longer. But you remember two years ago when it happened, it, was, it kind of surprised me. I was surprised how much, uh, I was surprised how big uh, it was. I was surprised at the uh, reactions. I was surprised at the government's reaction. Now, did anybody happen to live in Ottawa during that time? What were your feelings about living in Ottawa during that time? There's a lot of traffic. Did anybody else live in Ottawa during that time? Uh, friends that I know and colleagues that I know that were living uh, in downtown Ottawa, from what I remember them saying is that it was just awful. Uh, it was awful for everyone. Uh, it was awful because it was cold. People were camped out. It was awful if you lived there because you couldn't get anywhere. Uh, there was a lot of media attention. It was just awful for everyone. Um, if you were a uh, resident of Ottawa, uh, someone who lived in, and worked in downtown Ottawa, uh, and this was interrupting uh, your daily routine, uh, you might be forgiven if you formed a negative generalization about individuals who expressed support uh, for the Freedom Convoy at the time. Uh, you might uh, have experienced negative interactions or maybe not any personal negative interactions, but maybe just uh, the fallout of having everything disrupted for a month. It's hard enough to live in Ottawa uh, in January, right? Because it's really cold. Uh, and imagine sort of all of the additional stuff uh, frustrating and everyone was frustrated with uh, COVID policy. Everyone was frustrated with those things. So you can imagine forming generalizations. And that seemed to be what happened uh, that year uh, is that you know some lines were drawn. People either supported convoy, uh, freedom convoyers or they did not support freedom convoyers. And there was a little bit, of, there was more tension than most people were probably uh, familiar with or expecting uh, in that case. That's an example of a generalization you might have one or two, if you lived in Ottawa, you worked in Ottawa, you might have one or two negative interactions and say, this is noisy. Uh, what are these people doing here? They're not from Ottawa. Why are they parked? Why have they parked their trucks? You might then form an entire generalization about the entire class. And that, of course, is the representativeness heuristic. Uh, that's what underlies stereotypes. That's what underlies prejudice, prejudices. And for a while, uh, even simple things like display, displaying a Canadian flag uh, started to have a little bit of a connotation, depending on whether or not uh, you found yourself supporting Freedom Convoy, uh, the Freedom Convoy, or repelled by the Freedom Convoy. You, a lot of people came up with different feelings about something simple like a Canadian flag. A Canadian flag flying on a truck uh, might be something that uh, carries a certain message now and certainly last year, different than maybe it did 10 years ago uh, because of those things. So we've updated our priors and there'll probably come a time when some of that recedes into uh, a little bit of memory uh, and 
uh, it's changed again. Maybe it won't have uh, the same kind of strong connotations that it did last year, especially. So generalizations, uh, inductions and inferences are based on memory and concepts. That's something we talked about during the memory lecture. That's something we talked about during the concepts lecture. And that's something we're gonna continue to talk about today. So all of these things, whether or not you are thinking about the freedom convoy or uh, Canadian flags or what to expect when you're uh, ice fishing or what to expect when you get your uh, wisdom teeth out or what to expect when you travel to Cuba, all of these things are based on concepts. They're all based on our memories. We're using memories to predict the future. But as we already know from lecture number, lecture three, lecture three and four, uh, inferences rely on heuristics like availability, what comes to mind most recently, uh, or what mo comes to mind most easily, uh, and representativeness, making a generalization about an entire class of events or people. These heuristics, which usually serve us really well, and in fact, that's how inference and induction work. They rely on these heuristics, and they usually serve us really well, but heuristics can lead to biases. Uh, they can lead to biases like neglecting the base rate of information. They can lead to biases uh, like stereotypes and prejudices, and they can lead to biases like uh, the conjunction fallacy. We're going to talk about two fallacies today. We'll talk about the inclusion fallacy in the second half. But today, right now, I want to talk about the conjunction fallacy. Conjunction fallacy is really common uh, in some cases because it suggests that we don't rely on probability information. We don't rely on our knowledge of probability when we make decisions. We rely on concepts. We rely on uh, heuristics. So most of you are probably familiar with this. And if you took cognitive psychology with me last term, uh, we talked about this with, uh, already. Um, so in the 1980s, uh, Kahneman, Amos uh, Tversky and Daniel Kahneman did an enormous amount of research through the 1970s and 1980s, which eventually culminated in winning the Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize in psychology for some reason. I don't know why. There should be, but there is a Nobel Prize in economics. And if your discoveries in psychology uh, lead to outputs that might be used uh, sort of on a global scale from an economic perspective, whether it's behavioral economics uh, or looking at market forces and decisions, uh, if it leads to an understanding that affects the economy, uh, then occasionally psychologists have won uh, Nobel Prizes. In this case, uh, Tversky and Kahneman won the Nobel Prize jointly for their work in uh, decision-making research, uh, which led to the Nobel Prize in economics. This is one of these ideas. So uh, they're looking at uh, extensional versus intuitive reason, the, the conjunction fallacy and probability judgment. The conjunction fallacy and probability judgment can, puts two things into conflict. The first thing is, if you have an understanding of probability, which we will talk much more about in three lectures, but most of you have a general understanding of probability. And you know that if events are independent uh, and you combine them, the, the combined probability is always smaller than the probability of any one of the constituents, right? Uh, because you multiply things. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, so that if uh, something is a member of probability of being a member of one group, whatever probability that is, and you then consider the possibility that something is the member of two groups, it's always, it has to be less likely to be a member of two groups than to be a member of one of those constituent groups. Uh, and for most part, we understand that mathematically. Most people can understand that mathematically when they think about it in the abstract. But when it conflicts with the representativeness heuristic, and when it conflicts with concepts and your knowledge, and when it consists, conflicts with your tendency to rely on the past to make generalizations and inferences about the future, we almost always go for that second part. We almost always go for the faster heuristic way of making decisions than the slower uh, mathematical way. And so what Kahneman and Tversky did was they asked their participants to consider a bunch of descriptions of people. Uh, and these are just two examples. Uh, they, would give, they would give their participants this uh, description of an individual which they thought, and they had pre-tested, uh, would inspire them to form a generalization. 
it would remind them of a kind of person. In other words, they're going to try to cause people to rely on their stereotypes, uh, to rely on their uh, prejudices, and to rely on uh, those kinds of judgments. Bill, 34, intelligent but unimaginative, compulsive, generally lifeless. In school, he was strong in mathematics, but weak in social studies and the humanities. So Bill is a 34-year-old math guy, right? He's not a whole lot of fun, um, but he's intelligent and really good with mathematics, right? And you could probably imagine this kind of person, right? Uh, not a fun-loving person, uh, but not a bad person. Certainly someone you would rely on to do your taxes. Uh, maybe not someone you would rely on uh, to... Uh, go ice fishing with, unless that required a lot of precise calculations, in which case you would really want this person with you. Uh, and then you're asked to rate these as to how likely they are. We can do this in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes participants might be asked to uh, respond with uh, a probability judgment for each one of these. Or when I've done this in class sometimes, uh, I've asked people to organize them up and down. Uh, so put the thing that's most likely at the top, put the thing that's least likely at the bottom. Uh, and one one of the things is some of these some of these seem kind of generic, like Bill is a reporter. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe he's a reporter. Uh, Bill surfs for a hobby. Most people would rank that kind of low because he just doesn't seem like a surfer. Um, however, most people would say, you know what? Probably accountant. Accountant sounds really good. This is the kind of person who I would think would be a good accountant. Careful, um, compulsive intelligent, strong in mathematics. That's who you want to do your taxes, right? That's who you want to keep your books. Uh, so you would rank accountant really high. Jazz for a hobby? Does this sound like someone who would play jazz for a hobby? Most people in Kahneman and Tversky's task would say, no, this does not sound like someone who's really into playing jazz uh, for their hobby. Um, and so those things might be uh, in conflict. One thing might be high, one thing might be low, but the critical item is this one. Uh, the jazz accountant. Uh, the jazz accountant always ends up being rated higher uh, than jazz alone. But that's a fallacy because let's assume he's 85% likely to be an accountant and 2% likely to be a jazz player. The combination is going to be lower than each one of them. Uh, so the, co the combination, the conjunction of those two categories has to be lower than accountant and jazz. It can't be higher uh, than either one of them. But most of us, sort of when we see the conjunction, ignore the jazz part and just say accountant. Yeah, so we already said accountant is high. He's also an accountant who plays jazz. Can't be more likely than just a jazz player alone. Either one of those has to be a higher likelihood. That's the way probabilities work. And so when you put these into conflict, most people don't use probability information. They use what they know about someone. Linda, 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright, majored in philosophy as a student. She was concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And so you might see someone who is a humanities-focused activist, uh, someone who cares about certain kinds of things. Uh, and most people would uh, maybe rank things like uh, feminist relatively high, and bank teller and insurance salesperson as relatively low. Uh, and the critical conjunction, bank teller feminist, uh, has typically been ranked, uh, subjects will rank it higher than bank teller alone. Uh, in other words, suggesting they ignore the, the, the probabilities. They ignore the fact that when there's a conjunction of things, uh, the likelihood has to be lower than either one of the constituents. So we would rank feminist high, bank teller low, and teller feminist uh, somewhere in between. Each one of those is a fallacy. And that's what they found. So a group of 88 undergraduates at UBC ranked the eight statements associated with each description. The result confirmed our expectations. The percentages of respondents who displayed the predicted order, accountant, accountant plus jazz, and jazz for Bill, and feminist Teller Feminist, Teller for Linda were 87 and 85% respectively. This finding is neither surprising nor objectionable. If, like similarity and prototypicality, representatives depends on both common and distinctive features, and then they just uh, go on to talk about how this works with the contrast model of similarity. Uh, so we ignore 
information about probability. Uh, we make our inferences based on what we know about people. You've probably met people who are like Linda. Uh, you've probably met people who might be like Bill. You've probably met people who are activist feminists, people who work in banks, people who are uh, work in a bookstore and do yoga, people who uh, play jazz for a hobby, uh, and people who surf. You could probably imagine all of these. And so what you do is you rely on these generalizations that you've formed through specific observations, in other words, inductive reasoning, uh, and you rely on this representativeness heuristic, which puts you into conflict with objective mathematics. Obviously, Bill would never make this mistake. Uh, Bill would not uh, use the representativeness heuristic. Uh, Bill would be happy uh, to order things properly because he would recognize uh, that uh, the constituents have to be a, a higher probability than the conjunct. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how we can work with uh, induction. Uh, we're gonna probably go until about 1030, 1040, uh, and then we'll take a break. Uh, hypothesis testing. Hypotheses is going to come up in two ways. We're going to talk about hypotheses next week when we talk about deduction. But for induction, a hypothesis, these are sets of beliefs about the world that can be stated and tested. Uh, so we can adjust our inferences based on whether or not the specific hypothesis uh, is supported. Hypotheses also uh, can be risky because most of us are familiar with the idea of the confirmation bias. In other words, you seek evidence that confirms your hypothesis. You tend to seek evidence that confirms one or another hypothesis, and we rarely seek evidence that would disconfirm. We show a bias against that. They are susceptible. So they're important for everyday thinking and for scientific thinking. Um, years ago, this is many years ago now, uh, the first home that we purchased in London, um, the very first winter we spent in the home, uh, the basement filled up with water, which is a terrible thing to happen when you first buy a house. Now, it was not a brand new house. Uh, it was an older house, but it didn't seem to have a leaking basement when we purchased it, uh, but it certainly had a leaking basement a few months afterwards. Uh, so we moved in in, I think, July maybe, uh, and by the, I think the springtime, or maybe it was the winter, uh, the basement went down where the basement office was, uh, stepped on the carpet, and it was you know soaking wet, uh, and there hadn't been a rain. Uh, so it wasn't like anything had happened that I would have expected there to be a rising water table. I was just really kind of disturbed to find out that somehow the basement had gotten all soaked. Um, a lot of places where the water could be coming from. So uh, that means that either me uh, or someone else that we would hire would have to figure out where is this water coming from? Because you can't have a leaking basement, right? Uh, you can't have a basement that fills up with water because all sorts of other bad things can happen to your house if you have a leaking basement. So you got to fix it. And the fix for a leaking basement can be simple or complicated or unbelievably expensive if it requires a lot of excavation outside the house. So we were hoping for the cheap solution and not the expensive solution. So we called a guy after I couldn't figure it out. A um, couple of possibilities. Maybe water's just coming in from the ground. Maybe water has just decided, you know what? Uh, I got nowhere else to go. I'm just going to go into this basement here. Uh, it's right next to where I am. Um, maybe a pipe had burst. I was able to rule that one out pretty quickly by noticing that none of the pipes had burst. Uh, or the third possibility is, have you ever seen one of those homes? And these are the kind of home that we had uh, where the insulation wasn't uh, properly done somewhere. And so they have a huge uh, ice dam, a bunch of uh, icicles right in a specific area. So what we had was a lot of ice that would build up on the roof right in front of the house. Either one of these could have been causing the problem. Uh, the basement guy that we called formulated a hypothesis. Uh, he jumped to the most likely, but unfortunately the most expensive possible thing, which is, you know what, the groundwater uh, is no longer being diverted away from your basement. There's a crack in the foundation and all of the water is coming into your basement. That means, we're going to have to dig away the foundation uh, and reconstruct the house uh, and fix it so that it doesn't collapse in on itself. This is not the kind of news you want to hear. Um, so uh, we devised, I didn't, obviously, you're not going to go ahead with all of this unless it's absolutely necessary. So he devised a test. He said, is there anywhere else in the basement uh, where there might be uh, some water getting in? I said, well, there's a crawl space. Uh, have any 
Maybe you ever grow up in a house with a crawl space uh, underneath? Don't go in the crawl space. Uh, I did have to go into the crawl space to look into this. Uh, and it's like Indiana Jones. You go in there and there's like spiders all over the place and you're trying to uh, clear through all of these spider webs. It's not a pleasant place. Anyway, I had already been in the crawl space and said, yeah, the crawl space is dry. That's what I can't figure out. It's on the same level, uh, but here there's water. In the crawl space, it's completely dry. There's no water in the crawl space. And so he went in to take a look. Uh, and that's when we determined there was an alternative. So we, everything we were looking for suggested crack in the foundation. Everything we were looking for suggested the hypothesis when we look for confirmatory evidence. Uh, is there a foundation here? Yes. Is the water coming in right below uh, what looks like the foundation? Yes. Uh, all of that seemed to be consistent. But when we developed a test to look for disconfirming evidence, in other words, if the foundation is cracked, uh, if the water isn't being diverted, it should come in the entire basement, not just the finished portion. So we went to the unfinished portion, which was on the same level, found that there was no water in there, uh, which suggested that the ice on one half of the house uh, was simply leaking into the basement. That just meant we needed to get rid of the ice dam instead of redigging uh, the foundation. So we knew kind of what was happening. Uh, the basement guy knew a lot about what was happening because that's his job, right? To diagnose problems in the basement. Uh, he has a lot of uh, general, a lot of specific observations have led to general conclusions, but we devised a very specific set of beliefs about what might be happening and then looked for evidence that might support or challenge those beliefs. And in this case, luckily, uh, we challenged the belief uh, and came up with a solution that didn't cost very much to repair. Okay, the last topic I wanna to cover before we take a break is our tendency, and this is again a bias, to rely on retrospective evidence when we're making conclusions. Now remember, inference and induction, the whole point of inference is that you rely on your memory to make predictions about the future. So you're always looking back. And when we talked about memory, we suggested that that's what memory's for, right? Memory isn't really for remembering the past. Memory is for giving you a base of evidence to make predictions about the future. Uh, so we need the past to make predictions, but uh, a lot of things are discovered through what we might refer to as retrospective designs. Unlike the kind of scientific hypothesis testing in the previous example, uh, a lot of things that we try to figure out are based on looking back at evidence. But if you didn't know what you were looking for back then, you might not correct, collect the right kind of evidence. So just some examples that I talk about in the textbook. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a paper that experienced, uh, that suggested a link uh, between early prescription and use of antibiotics, maybe in adolescence and young adulthood, and later uh, incidence of uh, development of breast cancer. Uh, and so as you can imagine with normal health advice, uh, often when it's reported uh, in health media, uh, the temptation to draw a causal link is always present, right? That antibiotics might cause uh, certain kinds of cancer. The paper didn't conclude that. The paper just highlighted the link. The link could be anything. It could be that individuals who have a lower immune uh, response uh, when they're younger who require more antibiotics are also the people who might be more likely to develop certain kinds of cancer later. So not a causal link, it's just that there's a link there, and both of those are things that are caused by that underlying biology. Do you all remember sort of the suggestion from a number of years ago uh, that anything with aluminum in it could cause Alzheimer's? How many of you are sort of vaguely remember of uh, sort of this idea, this link between Alzheimer's and aluminum? Uh, that kind of still lives on. Uh, it turns out it was an imaging error uh, on an incorrectly stained uh, slide. Um, that kind of lives on in the idea that uh, there are still aluminum-free uh, antiperspirants and deodorants. How many of you have seen these natural deodorants that specifically advertise being aluminum-free? Nobody really knows what aluminum does, uh, but it doesn't do anything bad uh, when you use it in your deodorant. But for some reason, those go back to the time when there was believed to be a link. Uh, most of our water bottles uh, and uh, containers no longer contain bisphenol A uh, because there was a connection uh, at some point between bisphenol A and the tendency for it to accumulate in the body. It's not clear what the negative effects are, but it accumulates. Uh, and since it seems like an unnatural chemical to accumulate, 
uh, res manufacturers responded uh, according, accordingly. Um, you're all probably aware of the now um, long since abandoned idea that autism uh, and vaccines are linked, uh, which goes back to a single paper that was published with a small sample size looking at the connection uh, that perhaps maybe uh, childhood vaccines might cause uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, all of these are retrospective or retroactive designs where you take something that was done and then you try to infer what happened. You try to infer causality. Uh, and that can be dangerous because in all of these cases, the link is nowhere near clear. Uh, the causal link is nowhere near clear. Next week, we're going to talk more about causality. We're going to talk about some ways in which you can uh, use correlational evidence to make some assumptions and, and inferences about uh, causality. But for the most part, we understand that these retrospective or retroactive designs uh, is a logical error. Uh, and that's because of our tendency uh, to notice correlations. Noticing correlations is also a form of specific to general inductive uh, reasoning. In fact, it's one of the cornerstones of inductive reasoning. If something is correlated, there's, a re there's often a reason, right? There's often a reason that one thing uh, co-occurs with something else. And your job uh, as intelligent organisms is to notice those correlations and to adjust your behavior to predict things. So if you're trying to adjust your behavior, uh, use your background memory uh, to know what to predict, to reduce uncertainty, and to make the right decision, of course, you're going to rely on correlational evidence. You have to. That's how you know how one thing affects another. Um, and you know what correlations are, right? A positive correlation, when one thing increases, something else increases. A negative correlation can be just as strong when one thing increases, something else decreases. And when there's no relationship, A can go up or down, and B, nothing happens to it. It doesn't seem to be related. We're also familiar with the idea uh, of the relationship between correlation and cause. Uh, and as I said, we'll talk more about this next week when we talk about causal reasoning. Um, sometimes results or conclusions are presented as if there is a cause, because most of us have a bias or a tendency to infer causal relationships between correlated attributes. We refer to this as an illusory correlation. Now, the idea that you cannot infer causation from correlation is one that everyone is familiar with. Uh, so much so uh, that it is, um, you know, it's it, it happens all the time, right? I mean, it's the kind of thing that you just learn early on uh, that you can't infer a causation from correlation, except, as we'll see next week and later today, you can infer uh, causation from correlation. In fact, most of us can't avoid it. Uh, logically, mathematically, and scientifically, we're not supposed to. Uh, but most of us do it anyway, just like we rely on heuristics and biases anyway. It's the way the mind works. We infer causation from correlation. Uh, and so you can see that lots of things, and these are sort of you know examples that show up all the time. There's no relationship between the murder rate in the United States and the market share of Microsoft's former browser, Internet Explorer, right? Uh, the fewer people using Internet Explorer correlates really strongly uh, with the murder rate. They're not at all related. Uh, you can imagine that the per capita consumption of cheese in the United States uh, actually has a really strangely strong correlation with the number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Can't possibly be a relationship. It's not the same people um, that I know of. I mean, it could possibly be the same people who consume a lot of cheese. Uh, and also, and that's the suggestion, is that if Americans are eating more cheese and more Americans are dying in their bed by getting tangled in their bed sheets, got to be a relationship, but we know there isn't. Uh, the number of people who drown by falling into a swimming pool, which is a terrible way to drown, uh, and it happens uh, on a regular basis, uh, seems to go up and down with the number of films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in. Uh, when Nicolas Cage appears in more films, more people drown in their swimming pools. So sometimes we see these relationships. People can point them out to you. These are never being presented as real causal relationships. They're presented as the suggestion that you can see things that are co-occurred retrospectively. And that's where the problem is. When you're noticing things that co-occur as they happen, you're much better and much stronger and much more uh, confident in assuming that there's a causal relationship. If every time I do this, 
something else happens, you're experiencing it real time. It's only when you look back uh, in these retrospective designs that inferring causation from correlation becomes problematic. Um, it is the internet blowhard's favorite phrase, right? Anytime there might be some sort of argument on Reddit or Twitter or X uh, or any other forum in which you might use to argue with other internet blowhards, uh, you might uh, experience people uh, arguing against you to suggest that uh, correlation does not equal causation because it's just something we all know. Um, Pearson's original work with the correlation coefficient was actually designed to give you a mathematical way to infer causation from correlation. Uh, so the whole idea that you can give a number value suggests, look, if these things are really correlated, if every time we observe one thing happening, the other thing seems to happen in conjunction with it, and we can assign a quantitative value, then we get better and more confident. It's not perfect, but we get more confident in understanding whether or not there's a causal relationship. The reason these things come into conflict is that when you're looking back over observations, lots of things uh, might rise and fall in conjunction. When you're observing things directly as an organism living in the world, uh, you're directly experiencing your effect on other people. You're directly experiencing other people's effect on you. You're directly experiencing your effect on the environment. So you know the relationship between causation and correlation. Correlation doesn't prove causation, but it is, for, most, for the most part, a necessary condition. In other words, causally related things are often, nearly always, correlated from our observation. So if, if there was a causal relationship between one thing causing the other, it's gonna be correlated. In other words, causally related things are a subset of correlationally related things. And that's why we make the error. Uh, we assume, uh, we extend uh, this causal uh, relationship uh, into the entire universe of co co correlationally related things. Not all correlated things are causally related. Okay, so we're right on track, 1036 in time for the break. Uh, we've discussed what induction is, how we use it, why we use it, uh, and some of the risks and pitfalls. The pitfalls being biases, uh, stereotypes, prejudices, uh, and the reliance uh, on correlation when we shouldn't. After the break, let's talk about Hume, David Hume's problem of induction. We'll talk about, so this is all going to be philosophy in the first uh, in the first uh, 20 minutes of the class. We're going to talk about David Hume, Nelson Goodman, uh, and William Quine's reliance on natural kinds. Uh, all of these things explain how induction works and why we do it. Uh, so what we're going to arrive at is the conclusion that we cannot help ourselves, but we have to make inductions. Inductive reasoning is something that's built into the way the human mind works. Second, uh, we rely on the conventions of our language to do it. And third, we rely on concepts and categories. Then we'll talk about categorical perception. So all of these examples identify induction as a natural byproduct of how the brain and mind work. All right, that's the end of slideshow number one. Let's take a short break, uh, maybe be back around 10 uh, minutes or so. Does that sound good? All right. Thank